and talks to us about forgiveness. Oh man, I hope that you join us uh, for bowling, any sport you can do while eating. It's a good day um, as a compulsive overeater. Good evening, my name is Scott. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ and I'm in recovery from sex addiction and compulsive overeating. Hey, I'm glad that you guys are here today. Um, I, feel, I feel very humble, um, humbled by the fact that uh, Scott would let me come up here and talk about such an important message. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about forgiveness, steps eight and nine, which are about forgiveness. And whether it's your first time in here or you've been in here for years, this is a great topic for us uh, to grasp and comprehend. And uh, I just encourage you guys to be able to hang out and enjoy what's going to be shared. I pray um, all afternoon and uh, even in our prayer time beforehand, just that God would give you ears to hear and understand what uh, he may be sharing with you tonight. But uh, I want to start with this, and that's that if we don't understand this topic, if we don't understand forgiveness, it can block, it can stall, and it can even destroy our recovery. That's how important of a step this is. And really, I believe that this should have been taught before Scott's lesson on amends. Um, and that's one of the stances we have here at the church is really, before you ever go make amends, you've got to do this forgiveness step first. And uh, because it's so vital that we do that, because if we don't, there's usually an expectation that we have, and that just breeds resentment. And resentment is what? Our number one offender. And so we need to make sure that we have this in our life. The reality is, is when we get to this step, and when we get defensive, when we've been hurt, what is the natural response is to be defensive, to be hurt, to be angry, to be upset. And that is the natural response to a lot of the things that happen to us. Well, if we're about to ask forgiveness for ourselves, should we not start by, uh, and also forgive others, one and all of them? I believe so. Even the ones that are most important to us, even the ones that have hurt us the most in our life, should we not offer them forgiveness? I mean, the savior of the universe has forgiven us. Should we not forgive them? And don't worry, I'm gonna get into a little bit of that in a minute. But here's the thing. We have so many cycles in our life. We have dysfunction, which by the way, we're starting a group for adult children of dysfunctional families coming up soon. But here's the thing, so many of us have dysfunctional families. Now here's the thing, I would not have said that when I got into recovery, I would have said my family's normal. But now today I go, holy crud, my family's so dysfunctional. Because that is truth, all of our families are dysfunctional. Even in my own life, my family can be dysfunctional. And so we want to break that cycle. And one of the ways we do that is by doing this step of forgiveness. I remember, I'm going to go back and get a prop while I continue to talk. But I remember going down to a football conference two years ago. And at this conference, it was actually a seven-on-seven -seven tournament that we got together with some other uh, football teams. And many of these teams that we went against were Division I, Division II uh, football teams, and what they did is they won state. So all of their offensive linemen, this is a long rope, all their offensive linemen were about 300 plus pounds. Crazy. So here's the deal. Our team is a wonderful team. I love our team. We got great linemen, but our team is a Division Seven football team. My son was the center. If you don't know my son, he's now wrestling across the way and he's wrestling at 147 pounds <laughs> as a center. So most of the time what he was doing is he was going against 300 pound guys and those 300 pound guys, holy crud, they were gonna decimate him. But I remember there was this competition that they did and what they did is they got a rope like this, a big tug of war rope and they put it in the middle and they stretched it out and they called this school out. The school of uh, Aquinas is what it's called. And so here's the thing. They, all their big linemen, they got their starting five linemen, two of them Samoan, right? And they grab the rope, boom, one side. And then they call out Big Valley Christian. We walk out and we're all, hey. But we grab the rope 
at the other end. Now here's the thing, I wanna set this up because there's literally 10 schools that are at this competition and they have surrounded the tug of war. There's hundreds of testosterone-filled teenage boys, juniors and seniors, yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs, and it was the biggest competition that I've ever been into in. And I was so fueled with testosterone, I was like, oh! I almost grabbed the rope and pulled myself. But here's the deal, is they said, go. And when they said go, the other team started pulling and our poor boys started flying across the field. (laughs) But then there was a moment they dug their cleats in, they stopped and they started fighting back. And all of a sudden everyone's like, oh my goodness, this Big Valley Christian ain't nothing. What is happening? And all of a sudden Big Valley started to win. Oh, and they almost won. But then Thomas Aquinas, they pulled it and they won. So here's the deal. I share that story because so many of us are in a tug of war with this topic. We are in a resentment, we are have a hurt, we have a pain, and when that happened, we grabbed hold of the rope, we dug our cleats in and we said, let's go. Our resentment, our hurt, our pain, not the person, grabbed the other end of the rope. And they started pulling. And we have been pulling and pulling and pulling for years, if not decades. And the only thing that it's doing is it's tiring us out. It's wearing us out. We can't do anything else. Why? Because all of our attention is going to that resentment. All of our attention is going to grabbing onto that rope and pulling. Even though everything around us is screaming and yelling and the world is get chaos, we keep pulling, we keep screaming. And today I wanna teach you guys how to let go of that rope. Today I wanna talk to you about letting go and letting that fall. There's, There's something cool about competition that is awesome, but then there's that time where you're in a competition and the other guys are pulling, you know they're gonna win. And so you just, everyone on the team, let's go at the same time. And they all just go, and they topple on top of each other. That's what we gotta do with our resentments. We gotta let go. Let them deal with the rope. Let them deal with the struggle. Let them deal with that. But us, let go. And let God start to take over. Let God start to do his work. Well, I wanna start with this, because we gotta start with this topic. Have you accepted God's forgiveness? I mean, have you truly accepted God's forgiveness? I mean, here's a quote right here from Frederick Nietzsche, and he says this, God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. I mean, that was a quote by a guy written in an article, and he said, God's dead. If you believe that's true, no wonder why you haven't believed that God has forgiven you. But if you believe that statement is false, if you believe that that is wrong, then we have to believe that God's alive. We just sang a song that God's not dead, he's surely alive. I mean, Mark chapter 16, verse six says this. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who you crucified. He has risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. This is an angel that's talking to Mary. And says, dude, you've been seeking Jesus because he died and we buried him here. Well, guess what? He ain't here. He's not dead. He's surely alive. That's what he's saying. And there's 500 other witnesses that saw Jesus alive after that date. That say and prove that statement that God is not dead. I mean, have you even maybe taken a step back to go, man, have I even accepted God's Forgiveness. Have I accepted the work he's done on the cross? I mean, what does scripture say? Well, John chapter 19, verse 30, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, these are his last words. It is finished. 
It's finished. All the struggle, all the pain, all the hurt, all those things, it's finished. He's done. Boom. And he dies. It's finished. When he died, he covered all our sins. He did the work. He grabbed the tug of war with a pinky and went, boop, I took care of that for you. Don't worry about it. Romans chapter three, verse 22 and 23 says this, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. But yet God died on the cross for our sins. And they don't have this verse up there, but it says this in Romans chapter six, verse 10. For the death he died He died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Christ died on the cross one time for every single one of your sins. Your past, your present, and your future sins. He died for those things. But how can God forgive me of my hypocrisy? I mean, in the height of my addiction... I'm hiding in my office at the church, looking at pornography for about six hours a day, and then I walk out of my office onto a stage, and I preach to teenage kids, and I want them to turn their life over to God. I mean, what? But how can God forgive me of that hypocrisy? How can God forgive you of your hypocrisy? The things you've done in your life that you would say, I have done horrible things and there's no way my sin would ever be forgiven. Scott, you don't know what I've done. You're right, I don't know what you've done, but I do know this. Christ died on the cross once and for all, for all sin. That I do know. But who has the power to forgive? I mean, morally, can you forgive me all my sins? I mean, Christ, can you really forgive me for everything I've ever done? Well, let me tell you a true story about Jesus who's sitting in this house. And as he's sitting in this house, these four guys and carrying one paralytic guy who can't move and they tear open the ceiling and they lower this dude down in front of them. And Jesus goes, hey, your sins are forgiven. Doesn't heal him, just says, hey, your sins are forgiven. And all of a sudden, all the people, all the Pharisees, and everyone's like, hey, sh- 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 who is this guy that can forgive sins? And he goes, hey, so you know, not only do I have power over that, forgiving sins, but I also have power over the flesh. Here's the deal, take up your mat and walk. <laughs> Boom, and it happens. He proves he's got the power to do those things. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus has that power. Romans chapter 10, verses nine and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. If you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that you're a sinner and that you believe Christ died on the cross once and for all for all your sins, and therefore you're forgiven, if you believe and you confess those things, you are saved. Some of you haven't done that yet. I understand, that goes back to steps two and three. But tonight, maybe you have that opportunity. Tonight, maybe you will make that choice to do that. But not only have you forgiven or have you accepted God's forgiveness? But here's the next step, because we have to deal with that first, and once we deal with our relationship with God and we're good, now we can start dealing with the relationships of others, and have you forgiven others who have hurt you? I mean, there's some pretty deep wounds sitting in this room. There's some hurt and some pain. There's some betrayal. There's some deceit. There's some abuse. There's some, a lot of deep stuff that's happened in this room. Well, not in this room, but by people that are in this room. If Jesus has forgiven our sins and given us the ministry of reconciliation, then we are to forgive others. You're all, Scott, what does that mean? Well, we read it every single week. Every week we read it. And it's out of 2 Corinthians chapter, this one's out of chapter five, 
verse 18 and 19 says this. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, who reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. See, God has shown us and given us that example of what it means to be reconciled to him. And now he entrusts us as believers in Jesus Christ to be that example and that message to those who have heard us, to give them that ministry of reconciliation, to teach them those things and to forgive. But Scott, I can't. You don't know what they've done to me. You don't know how they treat me. I mean, every single day I wake up and they still treat me like crap. I know. I'm dealing with a relationship right now that goes back decades for me. Decades of hurt and pain. And here's what happens. Every time I talk to the person, something else comes up to just reignite that hurt and pain. Again and again and again. And guess what I get to do again and again and again, and that's forgive. Because I have no other choice. Because if I have a choice, my choice is to grab onto the rope and start pulling. I start fighting it. I pick up that resentment again. I pick up that bitterness and that hurt and that pain. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 and 18 say this. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. God calls us to live at peace with everyone. And that peace comes with us forgiving them. Even if they've never asked for forgiveness. I was taught different growing up. I was taught that you only forgive if they ask for forgiveness. But I'm taught by the word of God here that I'm to offer forgiveness because I need to be that example of reconciliation to them in their life. I'm to be that godly witness to them. And so I must forgive that I may live peaceably with them. Sometimes living peaceably with them is simply not engaging in the fight They grab the rope and they start tugging and they start pulling and they start yanking and you simply let it go and let them deal with it. And I know it sounds easy to say let it go. But it's simply praying and once again asking God to help you with that forgiveness and it is a process. It's not necessarily a one-time deal, especially for those deep wounds. I mean, I think about the people in this room that have been raped. I mean, how do you forgive that in one fell swoop? You don't. But here's the thing. Every time that that comes to your mind, you have to forgive. Every time that resentment pops up, every time that image pops up, every time that emotion pops up, you have to forgive. The person that's been abused, the person that has flashbacks of the traumatic experience that's happened to them, the wife that's been cheated on numerous times, We have to forgive because it's a process. I mean, have you forgiven those that have hurt you? Most part I have, but I did tell you about one of mine that I'm still working on, and it's a process every time. And just this last weekend, it happened again, and I'm still forgiving. And I'm telling you what, it jacked me up pretty good. But I have to keep forgiving. It's a process. There's this list that we make in the fourth step of those who have hurt us. It's that list that we take and that's our forgiveness list. Those are the people that we have to forgive for the things that they've done to us. And it's not your will, it's God's will. You don't get to choose who you forgive and who you don't forgive. God has laid it out pretty plain and simple for us. See, some of us have misplaced anger. Some of us are angry at God. Some of us are angry at other things. And it says this in 1 Peter 5.10, and the God of all grace who called you 
to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That God will restore you. When we lean upon him, when we let go of the rope and we grab God, what happens? He starts to restore us. When we start to work our program, he starts to restore us. He restores what the locusts have eaten. He starts to replace and help us heal and find healing from those things. I mean, those that have been sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused, and I would even go as far to say spiritually abused, spiritually manipulated. You know, when somebody throws a Bible verse out at you to prove their point in an argument, those types of things, Colossians chapter three, verse 12 says this, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Wow, that's pretty crazy that we'd forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against somebody, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Wow. And Over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. That we would take our time to forgive. That is the foundation of all those things that he calls us to have. How can we have compassion on somebody if we haven't forgiven them? How can we love them without forgiving them? How can we show them kindness without forgiving them? How can we have humility around them without forgiving them? How can we be gentle and patient with them without forgiving them? forgiving them because that is what brings together perfect unity marriages where people sleep six inches apart from each other but they're the loneliest they've ever been in their whole entire life believe me I know I've been there and yet God through forgiveness can bring reconciliation back to that marriage you just have to go through these steps of learning to forgive it even says it twice, once in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, and once in Mark eleven twenty five. 25, it says this, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. When we hold on to our resentments, when we hold on to that hurt and that pain, it affects our relationship with God. It affects it. There's no way around it right there. It says it in scripture. Forgive others so that your heavenly father can forgive you. That's crazy. But not only have you accepted God's forgiveness and and forgiven others, but how about have you forgiven yourself? I mean, some of us in this room struggle with forgiving ourselves because we know what we've done. Not necessarily things out in public, but what about the things in private? What about those guys like me that have been looking at porn for years and we know the amount of porn that we put into our eyes and into our body and we can't forgive ourselves because of our unfaithfulness in that? Have I forgiven myself? I have to. It's tough at times. There's still guilt and there's still shame that, that, that creeps back in, but I have to forgive myself. It doesn't let me off the hook, but it does help me. And we have to let God help us in this. We have to let God reach down and impact our lives in this area. And this is what it says in Isaiah chapter one, verse 18. It says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. I have a book that I share or a story that I share with my Facing the Shadows class, uh, an in-depth uh, look at, at sex addiction that I share with them. And it's a, it's, a, it's a story about a dragon and this person that rides the dragon. And the more times they ride the dragon, they, they start to grow scales on them. They start to become like that dragon and they hide and they, they, they keep themselves from, from being exposed as somebody who rides the dragon and they, they torment villages and they destroy everything and there's one day where everything comes crashing down and they're exposed and their gloves are taken off and everyone can see they've been riding the dragon and the horror that happens in that moment and yet in the story, the king who opens his arms and loves that son. Very much like the prodigal son story in the word of God where the son has done atrocious things and betrayed everything and he comes back home and the dad wraps his arms around his son and loves him 
and cares for him. If God has forgiven me, how can I withhold forgiveness from myself? I mean, am I God? I mean, that goes back to steps two and three where I actually think that I'm better than God or that I am myself and God. And that is a lot of our problems in our culture. A lot of times we think that we're God. And therefore we feel like it's just if we hold on to that resentment or that shame. If I can't forgive myself, then the forgiveness I offer others is all superficial. I can't truly understand the depth of forgiveness. It's not assigning blame or letting myself off the hook, but it's simply acknowledging that I'm a sinner. God's forgiven me and therefore I have to forgive myself. It's acknowledging that I'm human, that I make mistakes, that I'm not perfect because reality is you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Now let me say that one more time so you hear it. You don't have to be perfect. God was perfect for us. So accept that. I'm not perfect, so let me get up, dust myself off, and try again. When you fall off the horse, what do you do? You get back on. When you get knocked back down in football, what do you do? You get back up and you hit them harder the next play, right? That's how it happens, right? So as it coaches, that's what we say. When you forgive, you don't change the past, but you sure do change the future. You break that cycle. And so today I challenge you. If you're holding on to this rope and then you're in a tug of war with life, with hurts, with resentments, I challenge you today to forgive. And if the only thing you can do is simply pray to God and say, God, I don't know how to do this, but I ask that you help me to forgive. I ask that you help me to learn to let go of that rope, that you would do that, that you would drop that rope and you would learn to walk away. And if you don't know how to do that, let me tell you, you're in the right place because the steps will help you. So I encourage you, if you're holding on to that rope, get in a step study, go through a step study. We've got a woman's step study starting here soon and we've got a guy's one that's gonna be starting on Sunday mornings coming up in March or early April. So I encourage you, get in a step study. Will you guys pray with me so we can close our time? Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for these men and women. And I know that there's some in this room that even as I talk, they just sit there in disbelief. Like, how do I even start? How do I even forgive? Because I can't. And so Lord, help them with this journey to learn to let go, to learn to let God, to learn to forgive. Not for the other person, but for themselves to let them have peace in their own life, to let go of that turmoil that's going on inside them, that every time that person steps in the room that they have that resentment towards, that it no longer festers and boils inside of them. So Lord, help them in this process. If there's those that tonight have never received your forgiveness, that they believe in their heart and they confess with their mouth that you are Lord, that you've done those things that they're forgiven, that they receive you today as that free gift. Lord, thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, seriously, if you did make that uh, commitment today, I encourage you, talk to your open share group, talk to me, but we'd love to, to talk to you a little bit more about that. Let's stand and close our time with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen.